Good evening, everyone. Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. I want to welcome us all to FSM Daily Digital Show. I trust that you're having a good day this far. And if you're not having a good day so far, we're here to encourage you in the Lord. And if you are having a good day, we're asking you to help us to encourage someone else in the Lord. And that is the summary of Christianity. When Jesus was on earth, Jesus summarizes his Ten Commandments, love God and love each other. The objectives of this show is to follow in the footstep of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Bible says in all things, Jesus is our perfect example. And the example that is set for us is that we will love God and love each other. And so I'm just here to uh, welcome all of us this evening to FSM Daily Digital Show. And I know that you're here to help us to accomplish the show's two objectives. Yes, we are cognizant of the fact that some of us here are sick physically in our body. Some of us are going through financial difficulties. So some of us are having a rough day because those who we love are sick. But we're here to bring good news that the God who we serve love us so much that nothing in this world would separate him and his love from us. So much that he gave his own, his own life to give us life and give us more abundantly. And so we are here to spread good news. Good news that there's hope even if you're having a bad day. There's hope even if you're sick. And there's hope if those that you love are sick and even pass for this, from this virus or other illnesses. There is good news. God has our back. And so again, be encouraged in the Lord. Our honored guests this evening, and also my professor and mentor, Dr. Hannah, is here with us this evening. And so I know that God has good things in store for you, even for this show. God has something good to encourage us all in the Lord. But just to open up another line of evidence here, we basically have two options. Uh, for simplicity's sake, we could come up with other options. But for argument's sake here, we have two options we could consider with regard to consciousness which is one of the issues you raised, the consciousness of God. So we have two options. Either there is a consciousness that is part of the cause of the existence of the universe, or there isn't a consciousness that is part of the cause of the existence of the universe. If there is no consciousness that was there from the start, then that implies that the universe, which had an unconscious cause, then evolved within it consciousness, such as consciousness that we have as human beings. In other words, our human consciousness is a product of just the blind forces of naturalistic evolution and natural selection produce the human consciousness that can do advanced science and advanced mathematics and uh, you know, create Astrono the science of astronomy and, and the Big Bang Theory, all these scientific theories that humans have produced with their conscious, scientific, rational thought, all of this is simply the product of a naturalistic evolution that doesn't have consciousness as the starting point. So this is being discussed right now by many philosophers, both Christian and non-Christian, and an increasing number of even non-Christian and non-religious philosophers are beginning to explore the possibility that maybe the universe does have consciousness as its ground rather than consciousness being simply a byproduct of evolution. Um, so that there would be a consciousness that undergirds the whole of the, the creation as well as the consciousness that exists within the creation. So this is actually a live, viable, philosophical rational argument that's being proposed both by theistic and religious philosophers, but even also by some agnostic philosophers. The whole question of whether or not the universe is fundamentally just material, or whether down at the bottom, at the ground of the universe, there might be consciousness after all. It's actually a live philosophical discussion going on at the current time. So both 
Christians and non-Christians need to become more informed about that discussion and weigh the evidence that's being proposed on both sides of that issue to discover whether or not science itself is providing evidence through quantum mechanics and, and the other new breakthrough scientific discoveries that trigger questions in our minds about what is the ultimate nature of reality? Is the ultimate nature of reality grounded in consciousness or is it grounded just in material uh, reality uh, out of which then our consciousness evolved? So just raise that as a question to, to think about and to discuss further. I don't think we can thoroughly settle that issue and, and prove it one way or the other in a brief conversation. But I think that's an area that I would invite a further dialogue about, uh, Brother Thompson and, and Pastor Barnaby, as we continue our discussions about science and faith, science and theology, faith and reason. There's this question, too, about the relationship between consciousness and matter. Uh, is consciousness real or is it just an illusion? Uh, it, uh, are human beings really conscious beings or are we just you know, mechanical machines. And, and this is a debate that even unbelieving philosophers and scientists can engage in. My position as a believer, as a theist, is that the ultimate reality is conscious. And that ultimate reality is God. Uh, but is there evidence to support it? We need to go looking for the evidence. And I think there are, I'm repeating myself now a little bit, but there are even agnostic and atheistic philosophers who are beginning, and even your comment, uh, Brother Thompson, implied a, a little openness to this when you said there may be a certain kind of God who is the ultimate first cause of the universe because of the principle of causality, but is that first cause conscious or is it not? And this is, I think, an open question. Uh, we, we can't just assume one versus the other. We have to ask, what's the evidence that we have that the ultimate cause of the universe was conscious or unconscious? Logically, it could be either one could be possible. But what does the evidence suggest? Does the evidence really suggest that the ultimate cause was just blind uh, material causation? Or might it actually suggest that the ultimate cause is conscious? Sorry for taking too long, but my only goal here, even though I took so long, was just to set up this issue for discussion and for consideration, not to claim that I've proven that God is, is a conscious cause, although that's my hypothesis. But now we have to test it with the evidence. Back to you, Pastor Barnaby. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Do you have a follow-up, um, Mr. Thompson or Dr. Payne? Do you have a thought or anyone yes. else? Yes, I, I, do have a, I do have a thought. Hmm. I just want to, um, to, to, to give this thought for um, consideration. We agree that the, there has to be a male and a female for the next generation, right? We're talking about consciousness. And there has to be consciousness behind creation. In order for you to have a, a, a next generation, you have to have a male and a female of every creature, insect, bird, fish, whatever. And as a statistician, the probability of you having one of those things by chance, by evolution, you have all these insects and birds, hundreds of insects, hundreds of animals, um, human beings, birds, fish, and all that there at the same time to produce the next generation. What um, says you, Mr. Thompson, uh, in light of uh, both Dr. Payne and Dr. Hanna um, schools of thoughts here? Well, to, to go in with Dr. Payne saying that there has to be male and female, I would disagree. Scientifically, that would be completely untrue. The very first life on Earth was single-celled organisms um, that propagated by division, cell division. So you don't necessarily need to have male, female in order to, in order to have a life. It wouldn't necessarily be a complex life like we are, but to have a life, you could just have cell division. 
Then also on top of that, I'm sure everybody, you know, knows that, like, for example, we all start off female in the, in the, um, in the birth process. We all start off as Y chromosome. So basically, women, we all start as women in Ms. the in the womb. Ms. Mr. Thompson, the, Mr. Thompson, like that. Is, I don't is that is that a, doctor, a is that a but, theory or that's a fact? That's a fact. That's a fact. We all start as female early on. I can't tell you because I'm not a scientist. I just happen to read a lot. You know what I mean? Um, but we all start as female uh, at the cellular level you know, when we're a chromosome. And then we, you know, the Y chromosome turns to an X chromosome or something like that. You know, like I said, I'm not a scientist. I just happen to read a lot. Um, and then we become men, boys, you know. So I get what Dr. Payne is saying, you know. I just think if we want to be thorough, and accurate, life can go on with without male and female. But, but yeah. even, even, in, even in the simple um, illustration, a spirogyro has both male and female um, characteristic. That's how it produces the next generation. So even in the, in, in the simple single cell um, thing, you do have male and female characteristics. Uh, as we uh, as we go over, uh, I'm going to go back to Dr. Hanna. But just before I go back to Dr. Hanna, um, um, Mr. Thompson, you did uh, uh, acknowledge that you're not a scientist, um, but I, I just want, for the record, I just want to let you know that Dr. Payne is a scientist, and so and he and he did share with you the point that it seemed to refute refute what you just said. Back to you, Dr. Dr. Hanna. Yeah, I, I don't think we need Hold to. Hold on one second, rush Owen, to... um, or Pastor Barnaby. Just sorry, um, Dr. Hanna, but I just want to say one thing sure. real quick. I, I respect the fact that Dr. Um, Payne, Dr. Hanna, and everybody has PhDs and they're scientists and everything. Like I said, I'm not a scientist. Um, people who went to school obviously are very educated, but I, I believe there is a difference between education through school and education through being self-taught. I might not have as much education by going through school, but I'm a highly educated person. I know yeah, that. You I know I respect that. But back to you, Dr. Yeah, Anna. yeah. yeah. I, I was going to make a similar point uh, in my own way to say it's not about refuting one position versus the other. It's about two different hypotheses on the table for long-term dialogue and evaluation of the evidence. That's why I introduced the issue tentatively the way I did, Pastor Barnaby, <laughs> because there's no other way to really have the dialogue with an atheist or an agnostic, but to have it on the basis of, let's study the evidence together. Let's not you know, define one person as the winner and one person as the loser too quickly. Fair enough. Uh, it's, it's two different hypotheses put on the table, and we continue to study the evidence. And I think, I think uh, Brother Thompson, did I, did I get the name right, Thompson? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Brother yeah. Thompson mm -hmm. um, made an important point of fine-tuning the point about life. Uh, depending on what we mean by life, depending on what we mean by fem male and female, you know, we have to clarify our terms. And now past uh, Dr. Payne, has clarified his terms to say, well, yeah, there's the male and female at the single cell level too, in a certain sense. Won't be the male and female in the sense of the birds and the fishes and the, and the humans and the animals, but through this dialogue, through this comparison of evidence, through the argument back and forth, we clarify the issues and we clarify the evidence and it takes time to come to a firm argument as to whether or not the evidence leads us to exist to the existence of God as a conscious personal being, or the evidence leads us simply to a kind of impersonal, physical, uh, ultimate source of the universe. So I want us to learn how, when we have these dialogues, to keep that openness 
to the fact that the evidence could be interpreted in both ways, and there's no quick, sudden <laughs> way of winning the argument. If it was so easy, we wouldn't even be having the argument because everyone would be an atheist or everyone would be a believer. But the fact that we have disagreements, the fact that we have some who draw atheistic conclusion and some who draw an atheistic conclusion means that the evidence can be interpreted in two ways. And that's why I responded the way I did even when you raised the question about being skeptical about the vaccine. You know, I, by the way, I have already taken my first dose of the Moderna vaccine. I'm waiting for the second dose. And so I'm part of the evidence that at least you don't drop dead when you get the first dose of the Moderna vaccine. I, I got the vaccine um, and I'm still alive and I haven't had any blood clots and so on and so forth. So, um, so, but does that prove just the fact that I took it and, uh, and, and I'm okay? Does that prove that it's safe? No, one person's experience is not sufficient evidence. That's why the scientists do hundreds of thousands of experiments to see if it's safe, you see? So it's a process and it's not a simple matter of, I gave you two arguments, now God exists, <laughs> you know? Or you gave me two arguments, God does not exist. It's a deep philosophical question. And the process of collecting evidence and interpreting evidence uh, is a process that we need to give time to. And some people have been theists for many decades, and then they come across new evidence and they lose their faith. They become atheists. And there are actually some cases where atheists come across new evidence and they get converted and become theists. So it kind of, it's a complicated process, you see. Some people change their position from theist to atheist, and some people change their position from atheist to theist. This is part of the complication of processing evidence in a real world such as what we live in. But if we are committed to the process, and we trust the process, and we respect reason, then we can have a real meaningful and creative and mutually beneficial dialogue, even among people who have different points of view, and we can all benefit from that process. But the key is to not rush too quickly to assume that, that one side has refuted the other side, because that, that's uh, just to be a little bit too rushing to jump to the conclusion. Uh, what we have is a back and forth, a give and take of the conversation. We keep evaluating the evidence. And hopefully, I would be open-minded enough to say that if the evidence comes in in such a heavy-weighted way, I would be willing to give up my theism and become an atheist if the evidence required me to do it. And if I'm not willing to say that, then how can I expect the atheist to be willing to say, well, yeah, if you give me enough evidence for the theist, I'm theoretically open to the possibility of becoming a believer. If we cannot acknowledge an openness to evidence, why would we expect the atheist to be open to evidence? So I think it needs to go on both sides and we just need to be quite patient and recognize that uh, we don't have all the answers and the, the arguments for God or against him can be quite complicated. Here, well, here's my question though, Dr. Honor. Mm -hmm. um, b based on that clear definition that you just give, that uh, if the evidence go on one side versus the other, then one will be open to go where the evidence lead. My, my question to you now, how do you deal with the issue that if God is God, uh, the mechanism that he put in place to pull us towards himself versus the other forces that is against God? Um, because in my, I guess I'm saying this, if God exists, which I believe he does, and if God is all-knowing and omnipotent and etc., then that a force that makes up God is stronger than all the other forces out there. And so tell me about the forces that, it, that makes up God or make God who he is that's so powerful to pull us unto himself versus even the other forces that are not uh, from God. Yeah, this, this is a, a significant <coughs> issue that I have some thoughts on. Uh, it creates a problem in some ways for theism because one of the current arguments for atheists is that if God is God and he's omnipotent and he's all wise, he should be able to figure a way out to give us enough evidence so that we all become theists. And the very fact that some people are atheists and who think the evidence does not force us to conclude that there's a God, some atheists use that very fact as evidence that there's not a God. 
they would say that a, a, an all-wise, all-knowing God would be able to provide the evidence in such a persuasive way that uh, all reasonable people would become theists. And since that hasn't happened yet, maybe there is no God. So this illustrates the point of how we must recognize the strength of the arguments of the opposition if we're going to make a good reason and defense of our faith. And one of the, the problems is that often Christians are a little lazy about recognizing the weight of the argument of the opposition uh, because they are so confident in their own faith. You know, I have God on my side, so I must be on the right side. And I am like that too. But this is not an excuse for laziness. We need to become as fully aware as we can of the way unbelievers think, of the way scientists think, so that we can really give an adequate defense of our faith that actually answers the questions that they're asking. So this would be one of those issues. And I, of course, I've spoken on the side of the, the atheist there, Pastor, but you, you want me also to speak on the side of the, of the believer. So what would I say as a believer now about this issue? How come God has not been able to persuade us all to, um, to accept the evidence that he exists? And here I'm speaking only as a believer, Brother Thompson, for the sake of Pastor Barnaby and the other believers. I'm, I'm not claiming to have proved anything here, but just speaking as a believer, my hypothesis is that God wanted a certain kind of freedom to exist within his creation. And so he made a decision that he was not going to overwhelm us with so much evidence that it would be impossible to make a free choice about the matter. He, he decided to create us as free beings with a kind of libertarian freedom that can allow us to to make free choices about the nature of humanity, the nature of the world we would create as human beings. And he wanted this kind of dynamic, interactive, free interaction with us, which requires a certain kind of mystery. There always will be a certain kind of mystery to conscious beings who are personal beings in interaction with each other. It's like the mystery of, uh, the, of a husband and a wife, a man and a woman. Solomon calls it the mystery of a man with a maid. It, one of the reasons, uh, Dr. Payne, this comes back to your point about sexuality. One of the reasons why we are so attracted uh, between male and female is because of the mystery of the female to the male and the mystery of the male to the female. You've heard the saying that comes from the title of a famous book, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. <laughs> And therefore, we have trouble understanding each other, trouble with communication between the sexes. And uh, it seems to me that God had a purpose for creating uh, human consciousness in such a way that there is the possibility of misunderstanding. There is the possibility of mystery. And in this mystery and in this possibility, in this unknowing, there is the openness for creativity and personal development that could not be there if everything was set in stone, set in concrete, absolutely overwhelming, you know? So in order to fall in love and to get married, you got to take a risk, <laughs> you know? You cannot guarantee, uh, and all of us who are married know this, whether you're male or female, you cannot guarantee that this person you marry is gonna be the one you will be living happily with ever after. You hope that's the case. You do your scientific calculation ahead of time, <laughs> you know, to try to study the, the, the prospective husband or to study the prospective wife and to see if this is gonna be a good match, to see if it has a chance of success. But there is no way to guarantee ahead of time that you're gonna live happily ever after but you both make a commitment to each other that you're gonna make a serious effort to make it work. And the development of character that results from committing yourself to that serious effort to make monogamy work is one of the things God had in mind when he created man and woman. Uh, but it, it could never work the way it actually works if there was no mystery, you know? We would just be like robots or like animals, uh, but we're created to be humans. 
and to have a certain kind of relationship and a kind of fellowship between husband and wife that exists only in a very limited way in the lower uh, levels of the animal kingdom. Yeah? Some animals are monogamous, but they don't have the kind of relationship that husbands and wives have. And then there are other animals that are not monogamous at all. And then there are those single cell uh, animals or single cell living cells that you mentioned, Dr. Payne, that have the, the two sexualities within the one cell. So we have all these different levels of creation and the crown of creation, the scientist who is an unbeliever would say the crown of evolution is human beings and human beings have consciousness, they have personhood, they have the freedom to develop science, develop technology, to develop civilizations, to travel to the moon, to land a rover on Mars. So the question is, can this happen without consciousness? And there are some scientists who question whether consciousness really exists. If it, is it real or is it just an illusion? And if, if we think that consciousness in human beings is an illusion, then it makes sense to also think that the source of the universe being conscious would also be an illusion. But if we human beings are conscious, then we have two choices. Either a conscious being created the universe with conscious human beings in mind, or the universe which is pure material, pure cause and effect systems, evolved consciousness without the assistance of any conscious creator. Whichever way you go, you have something that has not been proven. Science has not proven how consciousness could evolve out of what is unconscious. And theology has not proven how the creation could be made out of an original conscious being. Both hypotheses are currently mysterious. And so both are allowed, I would argue, on the table for consideration. And then we look at the evidence and say, based on the evidence we now have available, is it unreasonable to believe in God? Is it unreasonable to be an atheist? Different people disagree about the answer to that question. That's why some people have chosen to be atheists and other people have chosen to be believers. And there are others still who say, the evidence is so up in the air that I'm an agnostic. I'm not sure either way. Uh, so those are some thoughts. Sorry, I'm taking so long. I you, know, stop. you know, Dr. Anna, I want to, do you have a thought, Dr. Payne? Yes, I just want you to add another aspect of it. I wasn't scared of studying science. I studied science and I evaluated the evidence and that's why I am not an evolutionist, but a Christian. Because I weighed the evidence and I'm totally convinced. I'm not saying that, I'm not trying to convince anyone, but I'm totally convinced that the Christian way is the correct way. But I have evaluated science in the process. So it's, it, it's not something that you Good just point. accept out of the blue. It's something that you weigh the evidence and you make up your mind based upon the evidence. And that's what I would argue that, that God would prefer for all of us as believers to, to be able to say, to the extent that I am able, I have studied the book of nature. Now, some people are more able than others, depending on the level of uh, academic training. Some people only have grade school scientific knowledge. Well, based on that evidence, they should do the best they can to decide whether or not they have evidence to believe in God. Others have college education. They should use the evidence that's available to them. Others have PhDs. They should use the evidence available to them. So the, the, my message is really first and foremost a message to those of us who are believers. And I'm saying to my fellow believers, at whatever level of academic training you have, you ought to be using the mind that you say God gave you to evaluate the evidence because the Bible teaches you to do that. And if you're not doing it as best you can, you're not being a good Bible believer. <laughs> but that's my message, Brother Thompson, to those of us who claim we believe the Bible. Uh, because there are some who read the Bible and jump to the conclusion that faith should be blind and without evidence. And I'm saying, wait, it's not the Bible I read. Bible I read said exactly the opposite to that. 
And so believers must stop giving the impression to unbelievers that in order to be faithful to the Bible, you have to give up your science and give up your reason and give it your thinking because that's a misrepresentation of the biblical worldview. On the other hand now, when we're talking with Brother Thompson and other agnostics or atheists, we have to recognize that our way of talking has to shift. We can't talk to the unbeliever the same way we talk to a believer because the, believer, the unbeliever doesn't necessarily accept all that we believe about the Bible. So if I say to Brother Thompson, you, you just must exercise faith because the Bible says so, that might not count as much with him as it might count with someone who does believe that the Bible is the guide for faith. So when you talk with the unbeliever, you have to use a different approach. Now, let me give you an example of such an approach from the Bible. Acts chapter 17. Paul was in Athens. You know, Athens is famous for Greek philosophy. Paul was in Athens and he was preaching the gospel and the Greek philosophers came to him and said, you sound like you got a head on your body. Come down and give us a lecture about this Jesus thing I, we heard you talking about. And Paul said, okay, I'll come. And on his way to the, uh, the speaking appointment, he passed at an altar that was dedicated to the unknown God. So when he got up to speak in Athens, he said, I noticed that you are very religious, my Athenian colleagues. You even have an altar to the unknown God. You have an altar to Zeus, you have an altar to Apollo, you have an altar to Hermes, but you have an altar to the unknown God. And I've come to tell you who he is. <laughs> you see, his name is Jesus. Paul was reaching those Greek philosophers in their culture at their time, at their level, to try to give them an openness to hear the preaching of the gospel that he was sharing. And that's exactly what we have to do. We can't limit ourselves to just what Paul says in Athens 2000 years ago. We have to speak in a way that can get a hearing from those who are reading books and studying science today so that we give a credible, up-to-date, modern defense of our faith based on the evidence that science is presenting to us today. And many Christians are intimidated because that's a big job. <laughs> yeah, so they say, ah, I'll leave that to you, Dr. Hannah, I'm, I can't do that. But God only expects you to do it at the level of your ability. If you have a high school education, you do it at that level. If you have a college education, you do it at that level. If you have graduate education, PhD, you do it at that level. God has distributed different gifts to different members in the body of Christ. And we have to, we have to value those gifts. And one of those gifts is the gift of scholarship, Pastor Barnaby, <laughs> you know? Now, in just saying it that way, I'm already updating what I see in the biblical message and using modern contemporary language to make the point. The beginning student of the Bible will say, what are you talking about, Dr. Hannah? What? I never read anything about a gift of scholarship in the Bible. You see? Well, the word scholarship isn't used. The word gift of scholarship is not in there, but the concept is in there. And, and so when Paul says God has given gifts to the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly pastors and teachers, I say, see there, right there, gift of scholarship, <laughs> teachers. <laughs> you see? It's a gift of the Spirit referred to as the gift of teaching, I just call it the gift of scholarship. So I use that as a way of updating the biblical message and saying to my fellow believers and also saying to unbelievers, the biblical faith as I understand it doesn't require me to be irrational and unreasonable. I must be able to give a reason for my faith in God. It doesn't mean that everyone will agree with my reasoning but I'm not really a good Christian if I don't attempt to give a good reason for my faith. And one of the ways to give a good reason for your faith is to respect the reasons for other people not having faith. If you can't respect the reasons why they don't believe, you're not going to be able to help them to be open to the reasons why you do believe. You've got to get informed about why people are not believers and then meet them where they are. Just like Paul did in Acts 17. He says, I see you have an altar to the unknown God. I've come to tell you who he is. I know that doesn't answer all the questions, Pastor Barnaby, but I'm just trying to communicate a kind of an attitude, a philosophy here that I'm sure we will build on as we continue to fellowship together on Wednesday evenings in the weeks ahead. 
Indeed, indeed, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, and as we come in uh, to the end uh, uh, of this show, uh, I just want to um, let the audience know, and for some of us that has joined us uh, for the first time, FSM um, sh show goes on um, seven days a week, and we have different schools of thought. Whenever we have the combination of Dr. Hunter and Dr. Payne, uh, it's uh, advanced theology. And so I, <laughs> I just want to let the audience know when, when these men of God are, are with us and they have a question from Mr. Thompson, then we have to put on our thinking cap. And I'm glad to know that Dr. Hannah is talking about the mind of Christ and how the mind of Christ deal with so many different um, aspects. It deal with our p opinions, our thought, our disposition, our intellect, our understanding, and so on. So uh, I guess, uh, would I be correct to say, Dr. Hannah, to think advanced theology is still within the keeping of the minds of Christ? Oh, yes, yes. And those are just a few of the mental faculties that I mentioned there, using the terminologies from the Apostle Paul and the other biblical writers. But take the principle from that and apply it in what we know about the human mind today, and we can multiply those faculties even beyond those handful. You know, there are all kinds of different dimensions of the faculties of the human mind that we're discovering now through scientific research. They all are to be brought into captivity to the mind of Christ. You know? Now, here's one of them that we don't often like to talk about as believers, but it's part of the human faculty, and that is the ability to imagine. Imagination is a human faculty of the mind that God gave us as a gift. And very often we think, oh, we don't need that one. We're Christians. We don't need imaginations. We just go by faith. But what about imagination? How does your faith affect your imagination? Uh, so every faculty of the human mind must be informed by our faith perspective. But that's another topic for another day. We can't, uh, if I go off on imagination now, I'm going to take another hour. <laughs> praise God, praise God. And in conclusion, in conclusion here, Question. is there a thought from someone? Question. Um, reflecting back on is that, uh, for, for, is that, that uh, the, is that doc, Dr. Johnson, is that you? Yeah, it could be. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I just want to, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> okay, a uh, question. I, you, you said earlier that if the, that I must be open because if the evidence was overwhelming, then uh, using what I know from their nature and history and my own experience, that I should be open to become an atheist as well as I expect that atheists to be open to becoming a Christian if the evidence was overwhelming that he mm -hmm. should consider it. Now, I'm gonna, I want to use an example. Eve came to the tree in the Garden of Eve, and she was given direct instructions. Okay, obey or disobey was the, was the option. Uh, when she got to the tree, there was a serpent who was eating a fruit and the evidence said that he was eating the forbidden fruit and he hadn't died number one that's evidence that guess what this this snake is not dead number two he's talking and most of the snakes did not have the gift of speech and talking like communicating in that manner that he was communicating with evidence number two so uh, upon that hypothesis I would say that Turn she on. made a correct decision to believe the overwhelming evidence at that time. And what it did for her was it changed the way she thought and it changed the way she felt about what she was previously told until she had this personal experience of overwhelming evidence. So would you say that Eve was correct in making her decision that she made at that time. Yeah, Stop. good point. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's a, an interesting and uh, reasonable interpretation of the story of Eve and her temptation in the garden. Um, I agree with some elements of your interpretation of the story. I would, I would add a few more elements. Uh, we don't have a lot of time here, so we might want to take more time on this than I'm going to give it right now. But just to give a brief comment, it deserves more than a brief comment. 
but to give just a brief comment on it, I would question the conclusion that uh, she had sufficient evidence to cause her to disobey God. I think she may have prematurely concluded that she had enough evidence to disobey God. But uh, I believe God gave her enough evidence that she should have not made a mistake in her reasoning and decided to disobey God and obey the serpent. Um, but to make a case for that would take more time than I have now. But that's just my pushback. I'm saying I don't think she had what I would call overwhelming evidence. I think she was deceived by limited evidence and that if she had thought a little bit more carefully and if she had used her reasoning powers more effectively in harmony with the mind of Christ, she would have discerned the deception, you see? Um, yes. So we I can don't be, have time to fully argue it, but that's my position. Yeah, so it, I guess there's a point where we, we can be deceived by overwhelming evidence uh, on, upon our senses, what we see and what we hear and what we smell and touch and taste. Because I think in Matthew 24, Christ was so aware that we could be overwhelmed by overwhelming evidence till he said it two times, do not be deceived, and especially I mean, we're questioning him about end time when he's coming back at the end of the world. And, and he was more concerned about us changing the way we think and the way we feel about his character, his commandments, and I think deception is definitely comes into play when we talk about being open. So we have to make that a consideration in our future discussion, um, being open and expect, as we expect them to be open, but then be aware of that thing, deception. Exactly. Aware of the possibility of deception is very, very important to mix into this principle. You see, once we recognize that principle that you're rightly emphasizing, Dr. Johnson, the, to be aware of the possibility of deception will cause us to be careful about jumping too con quickly to conclusions on one side or the other, you see? In other words, because today I got 10 pieces of evidence that God does not exist, doesn't mean that tomorrow I might find 50 pieces of evidence that he does exist. In other words, don't jump too quickly to make a decision just because of the evidence that you currently see. Uh, the, we need to give time to certain issues. Um, but how that applies to the story of Adam and Eve in the garden deserves a whole show just on that topic, Pastor Bonnet, to fully unpack what was going on in that story. I have some ideas about that. But I would argue that, that Eve acted prematurely on too little evidence. She did have some evidence because the Bible says clearly that she perceived that the tree was good for food. So she did her analysis and perceived that the tree was good for food and decided then that God had lied to her about the consequence of death that would follow upon the eating of the tree. But this was totally based on a misunderstanding of what God was trying to tell her because God was never intending to tell her that the tree was poisonous. You see, God, God, was, God expected her to be able to discern that the tree was not physically poisonous and that it was not physical poison that was going to kill you. But Eve may have missed that. And maybe the reason she missed it was carelessness. You know, but we don't have enough time to, today to, to fully unpack the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. But just for consideration, I would suggest that Eve might have been deceived because she did not consider all the evidence that God had given her. Uh, I would argue that if God is true, then based on his word, there is overwhelming evidence that he is true and that we should trust him. The, the, the enemy is not allowed to outproduce evidence compared to the evidence God can produce. And so if we make the wrong choice, it's probably because we didn't really pay attention to the evidence as we should have. But that's just my way of, of responding to the story of Adam and Eve in the garden briefly. It really deserves more time than we have tonight, Pastor Barnaby, so I'm gonna hold it at that point.
I, I appreciate it, Dr. Hanna, and I appreciate Dr. J Dr. Johnson. I appreciate Dr. Payne, School of Thought, Mr. Thompson, and all of us have been involved in this discussion. And as I share with you, uh, the show is here seven days a week. And whenever Dr. Hanna comes and scholars like Dr. Johnson and Dr. Payne and, and Mr. Thompson uh, is, adv is advanced theology. And so we have to put on uh, our thinking the cap, the mind of Christ, to be able to process this. And I think the and the conclusion of this argument um, proved that to be so. And so I want to thank everyone for engaging in, in this discussion. And Dr. Hunter, one of the, the thought, one of the, the topics that I would like for you to cover at some point is choice, freedom of choice, or also free will. Mr. Thompson, I just want to make sure that I'm saying this correctly. When I'm talking to mm. you, I heard you talk about someday you like to talk about um, choice or free will. Yeah, yeah. We started on it, I think, a couple of weeks back, but we didn't really get deep into it. All right. So this is what I'm going to ask for Dr. Honor. Dr. Honor, based on your schedule, um, and it, when it fit, when it fit your schedule, I'd like for you to talk about free will. Because mm -hmm. that's an area that Mr. Thompson would like to explore more. So um, on your own schedule, I would like to, I like to um, subject um, the show for when you, your schedule permits. And I could just coordinate with Mr. Thompson and others, maybe in his inner circle, that would like to be a part of the discussion as well yeah very good very good uh, very important question and I, I do have some thoughts about it and some studies I've done on it so I will definitely make that the next topic that we deal with currently we're talking about the mind of Christ mm -hmm. and I will incorporate a little bit of free will into that discussion as we as we wrap this series up but the next topic I will officially announce when when we shift topics mm -hmm. or when I shift topics mm -hmm. Uh, will be on free will because there's interest in that and I'm, I'm also very interested in having a discussion about that. So we'll segue from mind of Christ into freedom. So you can begin inviting people to come even from next week. I'll spend more time on freedom even next week and, and segue and transition. I'm not sure exactly how we'll do it yet, but we'll segue very quickly into an ongoing dialogue about uh, freedom. Okay. Is that okay with you, Mr. Thompson? Yeah, that sounds good. My father is omnipotent, one that you can rely, a God of love and miracles, tis written in the sky, it took her to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang the world in space. But when he saved my soul, It took a miracle of love and grace. My father is omnipotent. On this you can rely. A God of love and miracles is written in the sky it took a miracle to put the stars in place 
Father in heaven, thank you so much for the reminder we have just received in that wonderful song. It took a miracle to create the universe. It takes a miracle to sustain the universe. And we thank you also that you intervene within your creation to work miracles in our lives. It takes a miracle to be converted, to become a Christian. We need so many miracles in our lives, Heavenly Father, and we have confidence that since you are a miracle working, a worker, you are omnipotent. You can do all things. You have worked miracles in our lives before. We have confidence that you will continue to work miracles in our lives in the days to come. We thank you also, Heavenly Father, for the privilege of prayer. Uh, you told us to come boldly to your throne of grace, to ask for help in our time of need. And that's why we pray, because we stand in the need of prayer. I pray tonight for everyone who is listening to this prayer. I pray that you would help us to continue to grow up in grace and in knowledge. We thank you for the challenge to our minds as we study the deep things of your word and even study the need for us to study your revelation in nature and to become aware of the evidence, even from science, for your existence. This is a challenging call that you've called us to. And so we come to you standing in the need of prayer. We need you to be our master teacher. We need your wisdom. We need you to strengthen us at our various levels of ability to be able to think in harmony with the evidence and to think in harmony with the mind of Christ. So we ask for that as well this evening. But we claim your promise to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or even think in the name of Jesus Christ, our loving Savior, that everyone say amen and amen. 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 Our general topic, the secret to live forever happily, based upon the abundant evidence of Scripture and our personal experience and interaction with God. The evidence is clear that this is only possible in Jesus Christ. So as such, we present you the only gift that will give us guarantee to eternal life. And not just any life, but a happy life. We present to you Jesus Christ. And based upon the evidence of scripture, as Dr. Anna shared with us, God give us evidence upon which to base our faith and the evidence point that he is the creator of this world. He is the one who sustained life. Life is unique to God in terms of creation. He's the only one that could create life. Not only is he creator and sustainer of life, but he also the one who redeemed humanity when we fell into sin. Because Eve and Adam, particularly Eve, refused to exercise their mind and trust God. Sin came into existence. And as such, God died so we can have life and have it more abundantly. So he's creator, he's sustainer, he's redeemer. And yes, he promised to come and to remove us from this sinful world. So I give you Jesus. I give you Jesus, but he also can identify with us in our current struggle. Whatever your struggle are, God want to come inside your life and improve your life. So I give you Jesus. Again, on behalf of all of us, Dr. Hannah, Dr. Payne, Dr. Johnson, Sister Mortley, Mr. Thompson, and of course you, our audience, we just want to say thank you for being here and for gracing us with all of your presence. But not just on behalf of us, but beyond of Jesus Christ himself. Thank you. Uh, good night. We're looking forward for us to be here tomorrow again where we'll continue uh, this dialogue, the secret 
to live forever happily in Christ. God bless you.